Hey everyone, my name is Ryan, and I'm currently living in Thailand. Today I want to introduce to you my hydroponic and aquaponic setup, just to give you an idea of what I'm working with. There's nothing innovative about these systems. Um, all of the research that I've done has led me to the final product, what I've essentially built here. None of these are my own ideas, and that's sort of the incentive for making these videos, is that when I got into the, the subject of hydroponics and aquaponics and I took an interest in these things, all that information was readily available to me online for free. Um, primarily for forums. YouTube, I felt like was lacking in content in terms of home-based, medium to large size, home-based, hobby-based aquaponics systems. There's plenty of commercial systems and things like that. But that's out of the scope of what most of us are able to, to do on a realistic level. So that being said, um, I would consider mine a committed medium to large based home aquaponic system. Um, it consists of six, well, seven IBC tanks. One of them is left intact to become a fish tank and the other six were cut to form a grow bed <coughs> and a sump tank. And you'll see later on when I move the camera angle that I'm running a sump tank under each corresponding grow bed, which is nothing more than its counterpart from which it was cut. So we took one entire tank, we cut the top of it off to make a grow bed, which is filled with these clay balls. We all know this is hydroton or expanded clay pebbles. And underneath is its support as well as the sump tank. And then I've taken and I've attached each one of these sump tanks together to form one massive sump tank. And anybody in aquaponics will tell you it's complete overkill, and that is absolutely true. You do not need the amount of sump that I have here. But it serves two purposes. One, irregardless, I needed a support for the grow beds, which have to be higher than the drain point. And I had to purchase an, IB IB an entire IBC tank to achieve a grow bed. So, so for, you know, infrastructural purposes, I needed the support anyways, why not go with the corresponding, you know, tank that I, that I had to buy to cut into pieces anyways. The other reason is because of the extreme heat and the tropical climate here in Thailand, it, it's very simple, it's thermal mass. Thermal mass, by having a voluminous amount of water, my water temperatures remain very constant and I can get away with a lot more in terms of my water levels getting much higher. When it's 100 degrees out here and 100% humidity, my plants greatly appreciate this cool water which is always flowing from the fish tank. Reason being, the fish tank's 1,000 liters, around 250 gallons, and each one of my sub tanks is about 750 liters. So it's a lot of water, a lot of water. So even though the water coming from the fish tank is running through this two inch tube, this is the hottest. This is where you receive the highest level of temperature rise because the the, the PVC pipe warms up. It's a, it's a narrower channel, the water's flowing through, the water temperatures are going to rise. And when they enter the grow bed, even now it's still relatively cool. And when it returns back to the sump tank, which are, again is all interconnected, that water is essentially recooled a few degrees. We're talking a matter of literally a few degrees of change between the water running through here and then being cooled again because of thermal mass. And that's why I'm running so much water. It helps me combat the heat and it keeps these vegetable roots cool, which is extremely important with the high temperatures and the high humidity that we get here in the hottest months of the year. All right, so this unsightly thing is in fact a grow bed and there are things growing in it. And the reason why it's covered with this plastic netting is to keep the birds out of it. The birds have had a huge problem with them coming in as soon as the seeds sprout and eating whatever I'm trying to grow. The birds are very selective in taste and I, and I have to assume that for that's for two reasons. One, they know what is more nutritious for them versus what is not. And they also prefer certain flavors. They will not touch a radish. Well, radish, even radish leaf tops are relatively nutritious. However, they don't bother them because they don't like the flavor. Kale, which is very nutritious, they will destroy instantaneously. And lettuce, which is not very nutritious at all, 
apparently tastes very good because they will rape it given the opportunity. So this is lettuce and these are actually have been started um, in these plastic net cups which I've placed into the grow bed medium and I transfer these to the hydroponic setup. Well as I told you the hydroponic setup is not indirect sunlight, it's not getting enough sunlight so that's not going to be, you're not going to see that in these videos on this channel because I'm going to basically be, it's mixed, it's, it's, it's a dead project, unless I can get it moved. I can definitely move the cracky box here to the house, the NFT setup, not so much. Uh, it's, it's not really portable, I built a wooden frame, it's extremely heavy. Um, if I do move it, it won't be to the house because I just don't have room for it. So I'll just thin these net cups out, no big deal, and let them grow here if I choose to do so. All right, so here's a grow bed planted with, uh, this would be number two, grow bed number two. This is planted with uh, baby bok choy. They're going to have to be thinned out a little bit further. I've got a really bad habit of planting way more than I should be. My, German rate, my germination rates are so good in these grow beds that I can really, I, I'm just planting more than I need. So I'll have to try to use some self control when I'm putting seeds down because I've already thinned these probably three times and you can still see how densely planted they are. Root issues are, are never a problem and because none of the plants are ever competing for nutrients in an aquaponic setup but the leaf tops still need room to grow and spread and we'll kind of see what these do like I said these are going to be baby bok choy so they're not huge plants my main concern is that stems aren't touching stems. If leaf tops are touching, that's not really an issue. And they've got quite a ways to go yet before they mature. This is what we call in English morning glory. It's a very, very common vegetable in Thai dishes, or Asian dishes probably. Um, I don't know the name of it, what they refer to it as, it doesn't matter. I'm told it's morning glory and it looks like a grass right now but it'll actually grow to be about about a foot foot and a half tall and it likes wet conditions so in the aquaponics system it grows like crazy in 30 days from now you'll see this will be a foot and a half tall and we'll take it out of here and my wife has a means of using this stuff a, a, a large amount of this stuff which is why I'm growing an entire grow bit full of it she can use it in one day so it's actually a noxious weed in areas like Florida and the United States. They consider a noxious weed just because it reproduces and takes over, um, you know, swamps and things like that so quickly. But it's it's actually pretty good tasting. I'm, I've eaten a lot of it. I enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with it at all. And as I understand, it's relatively nutritious. All right, guys. So this is a lettuce mix. Uh, it's like a mustardy lettuce mix. Got some kale and spinach and different things and it grows really well here in the aquaponic system as you can see we have harvested the majority of the grow bed already and I have already replanted these sort of three quarters that you see is barren today and then you know we'll eat this up and I'll throw some more seeds in there as well and this is kind of a cut and regrow thing too you can get away with eating these in sort of a microgreen format and then It'll reproduce, not reproduce, but it'll regrow and continue to give you vegetation for a while. This is about as far as you want to let it go. I mean, this is really needs to be eaten. Otherwise, it's going to get too spicy and too mustardy and probably won't fit the palates of most people. This is uh, grow bed number two, and I've got a lemon basil plant here, just doing quite well. And I've abused the shit out of this poor little guy, and he's always stuck in there, so... He's very happy now. Life is good. He's happy here. Uh, a couple of Black Beauty eggplants. And that's what those plastic cups are. That's where I started them in and transplanted them. I just put the cup there so I know what they are. I've got two different varieties of tomatoes here. And these are obviously very young tomato plants. And one variety is here. I believe this is the, yeah, this is the brandy wine, pink brandy wine. And this is a Brazilian beauty sort of a purple hued tomato here in the middle so Brazilian Beauty pink brandy wine and they're doing well they're doing well in the next video what we're going to take a look at is the comparison of these tomatoes which were planted simultaneously in aquaponic and hydroponic formats 
So you'll be able, I'll be able to share with you the progress of this growth in terms of growth rate and ultimately, and most importantly, yield. In addition to that, we'll be testing the vegetable quality on the brick scale. If you don't know what the brick scale is, don't worry about that because when we get to that point, I'll be sharing all of that with you in a video, at least the sort of technical range. But essentially, the brick scale allows us to determine the number of dissolved solids which vegetables contain, primarily sugars. And it gives us an idea as to the, the quality of produce. And there's established scales for all vegetables, which we hope to achieve in terms of a poor, good, average, and an excellent quality crop, fruit crop. All right, this is grow bed number one. There's nothing in here right now because I just ripped out the watermelons today. They were growing well, but they had a fungus and the fungus, I just couldn't combat it. And even the watermelon fruits that I were was getting had soft spots in them. They, you know, they they had issues. I think a lot of that has to do with the voluminous amounts of moisture that's that's in these rocks. It's, it's a very much a breeding ground for fungus. In addition to that, I had them planted too closely together. I didn't have any type of structure to allow them to grow upwards. There was no aeration or anything like that going on. So this is the fish tank. As you can see, it's an entire 1,000 liter IBC tank. Um, it, it's pretty messy at the moment. I've got air hoses and water inflows and outflows and air pumps and electrical boxes kind of everywhere. And that's just part of the... Uh, well, I'm, I'm lazy. I'm not going to clean all that up for you. But long story short, this is where the water is coming in from via pump, which is pumping water out of the sump. This is where the water is exiting from. As the water is pumped in, it's got to have a place to go. This is its outlet. And that outlet essentially feeds the entire system. Each grow bit is fed. And you can remember earlier when I said that each one of these sump tanks was connected. Well, this is how I did it. Using the most readily available, most affordable pieces... I just use bulkhead fittings, which go in and <coughs> which attach here, and then of course just use a piece of soft hose to go over the end, ends there, and then over to the next tank. And the cool thing about this is while each of these tanks are filled with water, they all maintain the same level of water. So I can fill, you know, water in the end grow bed there, but still have the same level of water all throughout the entire system. So I'll never have an issue of this tank running out of water as I'm pumping it into the fish tank because of a drain or a flow issue or anything like that. So this is the hydroponic Dutch bucket system. And each one of these buckets is essentially fed hydroponic nutrients which has been diluted in water to these tomato plants. All of these are tomatoes. I've got two different varieties going here. And I'll come down here and this is the reservoir. This is where the bulk of the water is kept. And this contains the hydroponic nutrients. And this water is then pumped via the water pump through that line into the main line. And each one of these buckets is fed via the, one of these little spaghetti tubes. And you can see that that comes up and into the rocks. And again, I'm just using hydroton because I had a ton of it available. You can use perlite, you can use whatever you want. Some people use gravel, it doesn't matter. And as you can see, these things are doing really well. These are beef steaks. These first eight plants, I've got 12 buckets here. The first eight plants are beef steaks. Lots of tomatoes kind of coming in everywhere. That was my first and continues to be my largest tomato. And then the last four are Reisentraub, which are a German heirloom cherry tomato, which is supposed to have a very acidic flavor, much like a larger beefsteak tomato. I'm not crazy about the super sweet cherries, but I will tell you, these Reisentraubs are heavy, heavy producers. I mean, you can see, and I haven't actually picked the right tomato. Those tomatoes that appear to be ripening are the first ones that have come along. But these things are just growing. And growing and growing they're right now probably about from where their roots start about five feet tall and they'll grow all the way up and once they reach the top of that spool the support spool I'll just top them off 
same thing with these. I'm trying to keep all of these tomatoes single vine. I don't want the double vine because the buckets are so close together. And I want to get the max quality and size of these fruits that I can. So I, I've been pruning them back quite a bit. I don't want to let them go crazy. And they will go crazy. And it is very difficult to prune these because you'll get essentially what ends up being a branch and as you let it mature it turns into a whole new set of blossoms and you've got fruit and you just gotta make yourself cut them you, you just have to do it I mean even on this single branch I've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven tomatoes twelve thirteen tomatoes that have formed on this plant and it's not even it's about two feet two and a half feet tall and it can obviously will continue to grow if I had left this branch which you can see that I cut then we decrease the size and essentially the quality of these tomatoes so you can't have it all I mean you can and I believe you can I just don't have the space to have it all and I'm content with a single vine tomato once the water is fed to these tomatoes it drains here and into this primary drain pipe which returns to the sump tank. My water pump does not run 24 hours. Some guys run them 24 hours a day. That's fine, I don't. I'm running them three times a day, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, and I run them from noon to two o'clock. And I just keep water on those roots during the hottest part of the day because it is so hot here. And they seem to be doing just fine with that. The aquaponics, I want to mention, does run 24 hours a day. And that's important because you've got to keep the water flowing and it helps to oxygenate the fish, the plants, and everything else. And if I were to essentially leave the pump off, let's say I turn it off at nighttime, I could get away with it, and it would be fine. But then I end up with 12 hours of fish waste, which, which hasn't been pushed through the aquaponic system. And it sort of collects on the bottom of the fish tank, and everything's got to work that much harder to kind of get it out of there. So I just run it 24 hours a day, and most aquaponic systems do. Over here, I've got some different stuff growing in pots. I'm not going to get into that too much because that's not what this is about right now. But I've got eggplants and peppers and all kinds of stuff. And then over there, I've got another Dutch bucket system. Again, hydroponically ran. I've got six plants in there, three pink brandy wines, and three Brazilian beauties, which were planted at the same time that the ones in, that I showed you in the aquaponics were planted. The only thing I'm saving those last six spots for, there's six empty buckets over there, is for the Purple Cherokee, which are over here and they've been started. I'm going to give them one more week in their starter cups and then I'm going to transplant them. When I do transplant the Purple Cherokee, I will also put three of them in the aquaponics and that will give us an opportunity to compare three different varieties of heirloom tomatoes in the aquaponic and hydroponic systems and most importantly it's not all about growth rates it's it's really about end the yield it'll be interesting to determine there's so much debate as to what's better hydroponics or aquaponics and we're going to have an ability here because i've got these both these systems here at home to kind of test the difference and to be perfectly honest with you as heavily invested in aquaponics as i am i think for fruiting vegetables like tomatoes it's going to be incredibly difficult to compete with the hydroponic success that we're seeing here. These plants are all extremely healthy. They're producing great quantities of fruit. And it's hard to beat this. It's really hard to beat this. And there's also the argument of micronutrients that the aquaponic system just doesn't inherently create. You know, we're talking about your iron and your potassiums and your copper and zinc and all of those things that are in a hydroponic solution that aquaponics just doesn't inherently have, intuitively have. We have to add those properties if we desire them to be in the system.